Anime, ZOM 100, Bucket List of the Dead Starting from Episode 1, it tells the story of an employee named Tendu Akira who joined a production company with the belief that he could create numerous and high-quality advertisements. So, on his first day of work, he was extremely excited to work hard and learn from the senior employees in the office in order to reach or even surpass their level of expertise. On his first day, he was introduced by the company's boss as the new employee in the production team. The people there welcomed him warmly and with great enthusiasm. After the introduction, the company's boss escorted Tendu Akira to his workstation and introduced him to the division head. Right after introducing himself to Kasugi-san, Tendu Akira accidentally bumped into a woman who also worked in the same company, Otori Saori from the accounting division. From the first glance, Tendu Akira was clearly captivated by Otori Saori's beauty. Otori Saori also encouraged Tendu Akira, who was about to start working on his first day, and assured him that he could seek her advice if he encountered any financial or related issues. Night fell, and after the usual office hours, the employees gathered at an izakaya, a typical Japanese bar that served alcoholic beverages and served as a place for the employees to unwind after a long day of work. As usual, the senior employees inquired about Tendu Akira's life before joining the company, and unintentionally, he glanced at Otori Saori, who noticed that she was being observed from a distance by Tendu Akira. After a long conversation, Tendu Akira intended to ask for permission to go home after finishing their drinks at the izakaya. However, the senior employees presented their work ID cards, indicating that after the drinks, it was time to go back to work, meaning they had to work overtime. Tendu Akira, unaware that he would have to work even more as a new employee on that day, continued with his tasks and unknowingly fell deeply asleep at his office desk. On the second day of Tendu Akira's work at the production company, he became increasingly anxious about the way things operated there. It seemed like the senior employees were accustomed to the heavy workload and the rule of not leaving the office until the job was completed and approved by the client. They rarely left their desks, except for meals, drinks, or restroom breaks. Tendu Akira was forced to quickly adapt to this demanding environment. After two challenging days at the office, he finally managed to return to his apartment. However, he felt exhausted, as if carrying a heavy burden on his shoulders. As he collapsed onto his bed, he pondered about the work system in the company, considering it to be exploitative of the employee's labor. The next morning, he woke up feeling weak due to lack of sleep. He briefly contemplated not going to work but immediately dismissed the thought, forcing himself to regain enthusiasm and head to the office. He believed that obtaining a job he had fought for would be difficult and required him to adapt to a work schedule that disregarded the concepts of morning, afternoon, or evening. He casually asked one of his senior colleagues about holidays and leave entitlement, only to discover that none of the employees ever took them. They remained fixated on work, oblivious to the concept of rest. While Tendu Akira believed that the employees supported and competed with each other in a healthy manner, he also realized that humans were prone to complaining and comparing themselves to others. One day, while Akira was buying a drink, he ran into one of his kind senior colleagues, who had been working there for over five years. Even though his own salary was only 210,000 yen. There were times when Akira and other new employees faced reprimands from an emotional division head. When the employees considered their health, they approached it simplistically, but if this continued, it could pose a threat to their physical and mental well-being. Time passed so quickly, and before Akira knew it, he had been working at the company for two years. It was quite an achievement, enduring such heavy physical and mental burdens. Eventually, even senior Takahashi-san collapsed, and the division head immediately appointed Akira to take over Takahashi-san's unfinished tasks after he left the company. Although Akira was accustomed to handling other people's work, he still complained about having to work overtime again. He occasionally thought about a scenario where a missile would hit his office, hoping for a work-free day or even a better fate of dying from the missile impact. Unbeknownst to him, Otori Saori brought him food and reminded him not to forget to have lunch. Akira was delighted because he felt noticed by Otori Saori, which made him feel more sane in the company. Another reason was that he secretly had feelings for Otori Saori. However, the reality struck when Otori San was summoned by the boss. Akira overheard Otori San's audible moans as she engaged in an inappropriate act with their boss in the office. Initially, he tried to ignore the sounds, but when they grew louder, he pretended not to hear and focused on his work. After finishing work, 
Akira walked back to his apartment feeling utterly exhausted. He contemplated leaving his job by switching to another company or resigning altogether. However, when he thought about resigning, he felt sorry for his senior colleagues, knowing they would bear the burden of his workload. Akira had reached a point where he no longer cared about his job or the company he worked for. Three years had passed, and there had been no significant progress or promotions within the company. It could be described as stagnant. One night, while waiting for the last train to his apartment, Akira noticed an automatic door that, in his mind, seemed to block his path to enter the station platform. It crossed his mind that it would be better to commit suicide as a means to escape from the company that had suffocated his normal life. Upon arriving home, Akira continued working while absent-mindedly watching television with a blank stare, resembling a zombie, while eating instant noodles. Before going to sleep, he even shouted that he didn't want to go to work again. However, after a few hours of sleep and waking up, he reluctantly prepared himself to go to work once more. When he saw a bicycle parking fee invoice in front of his apartment door, he thought about meeting the apartment owner to pay the parking fee. As he entered the apartment owner's door, he intended to inquire about the parking fee for his stay there, only to discover that the apartment owner had been devoured by zombies. Akira, with a blank stare, witnessing the corpse of the apartment owner being consumed by zombies, was instantly shocked when the zombies started attacking him. When Akira ran out, he was unaware that almost the entire country had been infected by a zombie outbreak, and he was one of the few remaining survivors in Japan. He ran as fast as he could, escaping from the vicious horde of zombies, unintentionally crashing into a door with great force, resulting in a wound on his forehead. In that instant, Akira felt relieved because he no longer had to work due to the worsening zombie epidemic. He even jumped over the fence from the upper floor of his apartment to escape the zombie horde. While pedaling his bike, which he grabbed while fleeing from the infected area where he lived, Akira headed towards his beloved Otori-san. However, to his surprise, his boss had already arrived at Otori-san's apartment, assuming they were engaging in intimate activities. When they met, it turned out that Akira's boss had been infected by a zombie. Finally, Akira formally resigned from the company, pushing his former boss out of Otori-san's apartment and causing him to fall directly onto a pedestrian bridge. Accidentally, Akira saw that Otori-san had also been infected by the zombie virus after being bitten by his former boss. However, knowing that Otori-san was the mistress of his boss, Akira didn't care even though Otori-san had turned into a zombie. Akira still expressed his love for Otori-san, just as he had since the first day they met, even though it was painful since Otori-san didn't respond at all due to being a zombie. Nevertheless, Akira didn't care as long as he could express his pent-up feelings from the past three years. As Otori-san, now transformed into a zombie, chased after him, Akira bid her farewell along with the dark company they were associated with. Night fell, and Akira stopped by a mini-market far away from the zombie horde that could attack him at any moment. While drinking a beverage he bought from a vending machine, he contemplated what he would do after leaving his job, which had exhausted him physically and mentally. As he ran and evaded the zombie horde that had spread everywhere, he didn't mind what he would do in the next day, seven days, 30 days, or even one year. The most important thing was for him to feel free and unburdened after leaving the black company, which made Akira feel like a zombie himself. In the final episode, it was uncertain what would happen the next day. Would someone rescue him from the zombie siege in the city, or would he discover a group of survivors gathering at a certain point? Before entering the mini-market, Akira pondered that whether we have only one day or 60 years left in our lives, the time available to do the things we want is limited. In the end, he made a note titled 100 things to do before becoming a zombie. This is the end of episode 1. Continuing to episode 2, Tendu Akira woke up from his sleep due to a nightmare caused by the division head's treatment, which forbade all his employees from going home before their work was completely finished. He immediately remembered that he was no longer working due to the widespread zombie epidemic that had spread throughout the city of Japan. Akira was someone who was very enthusiastic when doing something he liked, so he shouted from his apartment balcony just to greet the zombies that were already wandering around his apartment and let all the zombies know that he would spend his vacation time working for three years at the company where Akira used to work, even though no one cared because they had turned into zombies. Akira immediately cleaned his apartment after not being cleaned for three years, and also washed his clothes that might not have been washed during his time at work. After finishing his household chores, 
He immediately grabbed a can of beer as a reward for himself for cleaning up after so long, while lazily lounging around because he had planned it. When he finished his second can of beer and wanted to get another one, it turned out that the beer stock was empty, and he felt regretful for not making time before the zombie pandemic struck. Whether he liked it or not, he had to buy it at the nearest mini market, even though there was no need to pay since the people working there or the owners had already turned into zombies. As he set off to buy beer through a shortcut down the apartment using the pipe attached to the wall, he encountered a married couple who were alive but trapped in their apartment. The only thing he knew was their surname, Kosaka. The married couple asked for help to buy items such as food, toilet paper, and some emergency supplies. Akira, being a very relaxed person, agreed to their request and set off for the nearest mini market. While pedaling his bicycle, Akira saw a horde of zombies that morning, even more than before. Although those zombies had a hard time chasing after him, Akira still had to be cautious of his surroundings during the journey. He didn't want to die before his vacation was over. Upon arriving at the mini market, Akira noticed someone's racing bicycle parked outside, complete with a small camera to monitor the parking area as a precaution once they finished gathering supplies for survival. As he entered the mini market, his mind was focused only on beer. However, when he approached the drink cooler, he was startled to see a beautiful woman dressed in athletic running attire with a thick jacket. Feeling lucky to encounter a female survivor, he greeted her and tried to make small talk, although he was ultimately ignored by the woman. But as the woman was about to leave, she noticed several zombies blocking the exit, which they eventually broke through. Akira, witnessing this, immediately stepped forward to protect the woman. Suddenly, a container truck appeared, seemingly about to crash into the mini market. In an instant, the woman instinctively pushed Akira behind her, and the zombie that was about to attack was instead struck by the lifeless truck driver. The collision created an opening for their escape. Akira admitted that the woman was incredibly cool and beautiful, the type of woman he had always dreamed of. He wondered if he would ever have the chance to meet her again. Seeing that his bike was crushed by the truck, he panicked momentarily, thinking of returning to his apartment. While running and searching for something to use for transportation, he spotted a scooter unit with the key still hanging in the ignition. Without hesitation, he revved the engine and took off, realizing that there was no time to ponder such things in the midst of this zombie pandemic. Getting trapped would make it difficult to find a safe shelter. As he rode the scooter, he thought about how the pandemic started in the morning, with people just arriving at public parking areas and scooters typically having their keys still hanging there. He briefly daydreamed about the possibility of getting an upgrade from the scooter, perhaps a larger motorcycle that he had always desired. True enough, as he glanced around while riding, he found a large motorcycle unit and immediately switched to it to continue his journey. Feeling that one of his dreams had come true, he expressed gratitude for having the opportunity to experience riding his desired larger motorcycle. After arriving behind the building where the Kosaka family resided, he climbed up through the pipe to deliver the requested items for the family. However, when he reached the balcony of the Kosaka family's apartment, it was already too late. The apartment had been overrun by zombies before Akira arrived. Night fell, and while drinking the beer he had taken from the mini market, he pondered why he felt like he didn't have any important priorities in his life, especially during this zombie pandemic. Quickly, he grabbed his diary titled 100 things to do before becoming a zombie and began writing down his dreams. After writing down 30 of his dreams, he felt stuck, realizing that he had forgotten something crucial but difficult to remember. Shortly after, he remembered his parents and resumed writing his dreams in the diary, hoping that his family was still alive. This part will narrate from a different point of view, as it will be taken from the perspective of the woman whom Akira met at the mini market. At 6 o'clock in the morning, the woman woke up and immediately began her morning routine, which included light exercise in her room. While listening to television broadcasts and online news reports about the zombie pandemic sweeping the world, she finished her workout and took her vitamins. She attempted to contact her office in Los Angeles, as she worked remotely from Japan, and concluded that America was also affected by the zombie pandemic, and even worse, the entire world was likely plagued by the outbreak. Before leaving, she took the time to monitor the movements of zombies and identify the ones roaming around. During her observations, she discovered two types of zombies in the vicinity of her apartment. The first type was slow-moving zombies, while the second type was the running zombies. After surveying the surroundings, the woman prepared to go somewhere by taking her bicycle, 
which was equipped with a small camera functioning as a CCTV when parked, allowing her to monitor the area where she left her bicycle and assess the number of zombies roaming near the mini market. Upon arrival at the mini market, her goal was to gather essential emergency supplies, such as food, drinking water, batteries, and portable gas canisters for emergencies. While considering which area was least affected by the infection, she arrived at the mini market. Once there, she parked her bicycle and checked the surveillance camera to stay alert. Inside the mini market, she immediately collected the most important necessities. However, when she was about to rush back to her apartment, she saw Akira walking towards the mini market. Despite initially intending to ignore him, she noticed a horde of zombies clearly chasing after Akira. Not wanting to get involved with Akira, she chose to stay silent while searching for an escape route from the mini market. But when she tried to exit, the horde of zombies had already reached the closed exit door. On the other side, her surveillance camera showed a truck approaching the mini market, driven by a zombie. Sensing an opportunity to escape the dire situation, she tried to buy time by responding to Akira's lengthy conversation. However, Akira's instincts as a man remained sharp when the woman was about to be attacked by the zombies. He quickly positioned himself in front of her just as the truck was about to crash into the mini market. Acting swiftly, the woman threw Akira behind her to save him from the impending collision. An opportunity to escape had opened up, and the woman hurried back to her apartment without considering Akira's condition after the incident. Upon arrival, she made sure her supplies were intact and sufficient to survive for the next few days. These supplies included bottled water, ready-to-eat meals, spare batteries, and emergency fuel in case she had to leave her apartment when it was invaded by zombies. While processing the data she had gathered during her food gathering trip, she realized that the man who was captured on camera, looking incredibly happy with a can of beer in broad daylight, was actually Akira himself as he was entering the same mini market. Despite the urgent and tense situation, why was Akira so relaxed and solely focused on those cans of beer? The woman was truly amazed by Akira, wondering how someone with such innocent thoughts could survive in a zombie pandemic. She briefly regretted not taking the Sakura mochi she had planned to grab but eventually decided against it. Who is this mysterious woman? What was her previous occupation? What will she do next? Stay tuned for the continuation of the survivor's story in the upcoming episodes. This is the end of episode 2. Episode 3 begins with a young girl crying after losing her parents at a host club called the Show Time in Shibuya. The girl is comforted by the number one host of the club, Sho. However, Sho is interrupted by a subordinate to attend a meeting with a client. In reality, Sho and the club employees are trying to defend their area from the rampant zombie invasion in Shibuya. Meanwhile, Akira, who has arrived in Shibuya on a motorcycle he obtained earlier, is searching for his college friend named Kenichiro, who is still alive. A few hours earlier, Akira, feeling bored, is seen doodling on his chin with a marker to create a fake beard and looks at himself in the mirror. However, he gives up on the idea, finding it too ridiculous. As he contemplates what to do for the day, Akira's smartphone suddenly receives a notification, indicating that the internet connection is back. He attempts to contact anyone from his contacts, hoping that there might be a surviving friend or relative. Akira immediately remembers his college friend and former rugby teammate named Ryuzuki Kenichiro, also known as Kencho, and contacts him right away because he believes Kencho wouldn't die easily. Kencho, half-conscious due to not eating for three days and trapped in a love hotel themed around San, is unable to escape easily due to the large number of zombies roaming the hotel. Akira inquires about his condition and the situation there and decides to head to Shibuya without hesitation. He asks Kencho to send him his current location. Akira and Kencho were close friends during college, as they were both part of the rugby club. Kencho was always the one who lightened the mood when things got stressful and his athletic body always attracted women on their campus. Akira knows this well because Kencho was his closest friend during college, and it's natural for him to worry about Kencho being stuck in Shibuya now. During a drinking session last year, Akira became annoyed with Kencho for constantly showing off. The stark difference in their occupations offended him when he was drunk. Shu, who was left alone to protect his host club, had resigned himself to the fact that all of his employees had turned into zombies. Feeling exhausted and purposeless, he chose to accept being devoured by zombies rather than staying alive but alone. However, just as a zombie was about to bite him, a loud car horn suddenly sounded diverting the attention of the approaching zombie. Shu felt saved, 
realizing that someone else was still alive and had tried to help him by luring the zombies away with the car horn sound. Akira, who had been hiding in a small pond in front of the hotel where Kencho was staying, finally managed to enter the hotel to find the room where Kencho currently resided. Meanwhile, Kencho, now conscious that there were no more zombies outside his room, tried to figure out what had actually happened. Akira spotted Kencho from a distance and attempted to pat him on the back from behind. However, Kencho was startled and screamed, but upon hearing Akira's voice, he realized it was his friend and stopped running. He couldn't believe that Akira was still alive, having managed to survive alone in the midst of the widespread zombie invasion. Akira then apologized to Kencho for not heeding his advice while crying, feeling ashamed that he hadn't taken his friend's suggestion seriously. He was particularly upset about the stories Kencho used to tell, which made him envious. Suddenly, without any warning, the zombie horde began to return to the hotel and immediately targeted Akira and Kencho, who were still inside. Without hesitation, they ran to the rooftop to escape. However, Kencho forgot to close the door, and the zombie horde held onto it, preventing it from closing. As Kencho struggled to hold the door, Akira helped by using a large AC exhaust fan to keep the zombies from breaking through. Akira had already assessed the surroundings and was prepared to jump to the adjacent building once the door's barrier was breached. Kencho was baffled by Akira's reasoning, finding it beyond comprehension that Akira was pushing himself so hard without any fear of getting hurt. Without further delay, Akira readied himself to make a running jump to the next building, and with determination, he managed to land on the adjacent rooftop, but not without blood dripping from his forehead due to the effort. Kencho, finding Akira's idea extremely reckless, was initially hesitant to jump, as he was terrified after looking down from the hotel. Kencho was extremely scared, so much so that he preferred being eaten by zombies rather than making the jump. His reason was that he hadn't told Akira about his true job before being attacked by zombies. The pressure of dealing with clients and having to fake smiles all the time to secure contracts through deception made him indifferent to praise from his superiors, the company, and even his girlfriend, who happened to be a model. Even moments spent dining with politicians and famous athletes didn't bring him any joy. All he felt was a profound sense of discontent. Kencho believed he needed to fill the void in his heart by showcasing his possessions to gain attention, make others envious, or simply impress them. Feeling remorseful, Kencho cried and apologized to Akira, realizing that he had only been showing off his achievements while being unaware of Akira's struggles due to his own job. Akira knew Kencho well and preferred seeing him use his self-confidence to pursue a career that could entertain people genuinely. Acknowledging Akira's advice, Kencho made up his mind to work towards genuinely bringing happiness to others. As Kencho aspired to become a comedian, Akira immediately suggested quitting his current job and pursuing a career in comedy. Kencho believed it was the right decision, trusting the advice of his own best friend, and followed Akira by jumping to the building where he was waiting. As Kencho prepared to leap from the hotel rooftop, they were faced with the horde of zombies breaking through the door, which was barricaded with various items. Realizing that the zombies could catch up to him, without hesitation, Kencho ran, leapt towards Akira, and shed all his clothes, striking a pose that made Akira burst into uncontrollable laughter. However, during the landing, Kencho didn't jump far enough, and he almost fell, managing to cling to the edge of the building wall. His grip weakened, and he was about to fall when Akira rushed to save him. Kencho was terrified, as falling meant certain death, and he was left entirely exposed. While Akira initially thought Kencho might have been bitten by a zombie due to his injuries, Kencho clarified that his genitals were just scraped from the fall. The night in Shibuya felt different for Akira as he was able to reunite with his friend, still alive. Kencho also shared the same sentiment, knowing that Akira must have survived. They enjoyed beer and food they took from the nearest supermarket to their hiding spot. Kencho shared that his comedic spirit had been reignited, feeling grateful to meet Akira again. He understood that their jokes were often about nudity but still felt thankful for being able to enjoy a drink while half-naked on the rooftop as their clothes were drying, and they hadn't found replacements yet. Kencho truly empathized with what Akira had experienced before, quitting his previous job and embarking on an uncertain new life. He sought advice from Akira, who had previously worked behind the scenes in television production. While Akira boastfully downplayed the nature of his job during those dark three years, Kencho, knowing the reality of Akira's near-death experience, considered him more than just a zombie. 
Reflecting on those who left their jobs to start anew, Kencho believed they often found success, becoming entrepreneurs or public figures. He hoped that Akira, who shared a similar fate, might suddenly become a savior in this world plagued by the zombie virus. Even though Akira might not be able to create a vaccine, at least his actions of searching for survivors, even knowing it might be impossible, could offer some hope. They spent the night conversing extensively until eventually dozing off on the rooftop. Their journey together had just begun, and they wondered what would happen next. Meeting Kencho might lead Akira to search for other survivors and collaborate with them to find any form of help to escape from the ever-expanding and uncontrollable zombie-infested area. Would Akira also be able to reunite with the woman he encountered before? We'll have to wait for the continuation next week. This is the end of episode 3. As Akira and Kencho rode their motorcycle to return to their hideout, the woman gave Akira her contact QR code, which delighted Akira. He believed there was no risk in exchanging contacts. The woman's name was Mikazuki Shizuka, and this made Akira hope for a future reunion if fate ever brought them together again. Kenjo inquired about their plans for what comes next, and Akira decided to return to Guma, his hometown where he had lived for the past seven years. What would happen next? Were Akira's parents and childhood friends still alive? Akira and Kencho went to an abandoned watch store due to the zombie pandemic that had already spread. There, they were searching for watches that they had found difficult to afford while still working in their respective companies. At that moment, he was amazed to see a watch on display that had been coated with gold. When he looked at the price, Akira could only gape because if he had bought it before the zombie outbreak, he might not have been able to survive with the remaining money he had. Kendo called out to Akira because there was a display of watches that were priced even 10 times higher than the one Akira had seen earlier. Without much hesitation, they took the watches that were still inside the store and took a selfie, proudly showcasing the available watches. As the evening approached, Akira's face showed his dislike for the rather complicated situation. Their supply of clean water had completely run out, and even using backup batteries to operate the water pump required a significant amount of power which could disrupt the already scarce electricity supply. Kanjo also looked at his smartphone, which could no longer receive a signal because the power supply in Tokyo was no longer functioning. This made them realize that they had to leave immediately because their stocks of food, electricity, and water were completely depleted. Akra, who had already planned to return to his hometown in Guma, invited Kencho to join him. In the morning, they had already packed their belongings to head to Guma, Kenko prepared the supplies that would be useful during the journey, but Akira, on the other hand, brought items that were unnecessary and even deemed as non-essential. Since they were on top of the apartment where Akira rented his room, before leaving Tokyo, he took a moment to stop by his room to bid farewell to all the memories he had acquired in Tokyo. Then they set off for Guma using Akira's motorcycle. Kenko asked what they would be looking for during the journey, assuming it might be food sources, water or anything else useful. Akira expressed his desire for a camping van, equipped with a kitchen, a toilet and at least some protection from zombies at night, which could also serve as their travel companion on the way to Guma. Upon arriving at the car showroom, they coincidentally met Shizuka, who, unexpectedly, had the same goal of finding a camping van. Akira believed that this encounter with Shizuka was truly fate, as they had now crossed paths three times in unexpected places. Without much thought, Akira invited Shizuka to go to Guma together. However, she flatly refused as she did not want to get involved in an unfavorable situation by joining them. Akira was shocked to hear this rejection, and Shizuka and Kencho simply walked into the car showroom without him. Akira began to follow them, feeling weak after hearing the rejection. According to Shizuka, using a camping van in this situation would be very useful and serve as their primary means of travel while searching for help, based on what she had seen in zombie movies. Kanto couldn't believe that someone like Shizuka would use zombie movies as a basis for survival. Unfortunately, it seemed that Shizuka couldn't drive a car and didn't even have a driver's license. So they had to persuade her to come along to avoid the unforeseeable consequences if she insisted on going alone. Whether she liked it or not, Shizuka had to join them because her calculations had gone astray this time, and she didn't want to meet a foolish end by forcing herself to go alone. 
Akira and Kensho were ecstatic as they gazed upon numerous camping vans of all kinds lined up in the showroom hall, leaving them bewildered about which one to choose. While they were thoroughly enjoying the process of selecting a van, Shizuka was considering which vehicle they could take. Assuming it should be rugged, versatile, and capable of running for an extended period without worrying about servicing or anything else. However, Akra had his eyes on a luxurious camping van that he wanted to use as their mobile home. Still, Shizuka clearly rejected Akra's choice because it was too extravagant and inefficient, unable to handle various terrains. She recommended using a rugged 4x4 vehicle, which was promptly rejected by both of them. In their selection process, they prioritized the van's utility for sleeping inside it during the night. As they looked around, Shizuka was drawn to a classic camping van that greatly appealed to her, because the interior installed inside the van resembled a five-star hotel in Bali. This led Akra and Kencho to tease Shizuka for her lack of consistency with her previous stance. Suddenly, a horde of zombies had surrounded the showroom area, forcing them to quickly choose a vehicle to use. After getting inside the van, Kencho made sure Akra checked whether the van's keys were there or not. Akra, already prepared to drive, stepped on the gas and left the showroom area, hastily heading towards Guma. Their journey to Guma had begun, and Akra felt that being on the deserted roads was quite strange. He had grown accustomed to the traffic congestion before the zombie outbreak. In fact, he found it eerie to drive without the usual hustle and bustle of vehicles passing by. Shizuka, who shared the same feeling, mentioned that logically the world was not yet doomed if someone could develop a vaccine to counter the zombie pandemic. However, it was possible that the person working on finding the vaccine was in another part of the world. Since it was impossible to search for that person, they should consider themselves fortunate if they could avoid zombies and survive. As the day grew late, Kencho, who was riding Akira's motorcycle, predicted that they were getting closer to Guma once they had left Saitama. Feeling hungry and in need of rest, Akira suggested stopping at the nearest rest area to stock up on food supplies and take a short break. However, they encountered a spike strip placed in front of them, causing the tires of both the car and the motorcycle to burst. This resulted in Kencho being thrown off the motorcycle and sustaining significant injuries. In this dire situation, they had no choice but to seek help from someone along the highway. On the other hand, a group of buses had blocked their path, and it turned out to be a group of survivors who had taken control of the rest area, led by none other than Akra's former workplace superior, Kasuti-san. He was shocked by the trauma and suffering caused by his former boss. He recalled the terrible days of his past, filled with exhaustion and emotional drain due to the pressure from Kasugi. The days were like being in hell, with no proper rest, an overwhelming workload, and unreasonable deadlines. However, as there seemed to be no other option at that moment, and with Kento injured, Akra reluctantly asked for Kasugi's help to save Kencho. He agreed to assist Kasugi for two days at the rest area they now controlled. Akra imagined that the work there might not be as demanding as his previous job at the company. However, to his surprise, the nightmarish work conditions he had experienced in the past were repeating themselves. And Akra, unprepared for this, had to comply with Kasugi's demands to save Kencho. On the other hand, Shizuka took care of Kencho by cleaning his wound and applying a bandage to his injured body. Kencho, groaning in pain, felt regretful that he couldn't help Akira avoid his incredibly annoying former boss. Especially in his current condition, it was difficult for him to face Kasugi's troops armed with baseball bats. Shizuka hoped Akira could complete his two-day task so that it wouldn't continue and he wouldn't be swayed by Kasugi's toxic words that made her furious. Akira's first day of work was exhausting. He was tasked with carrying food supplies, drinks, and essential emergency supplies. When he saw his fellow workers, they appeared tired but not complaining, resigned to the dreadful situation they were in because they couldn't do much to protect themselves. Akira felt like he had returned to the darkness that had haunted him during his three years of working. He didn't know what to do and couldn't help anyone, only able to work there and feel trapped in a tense situation where even zombies were used as tools to push trucks. When Akira moved a pile of seemingly fresh beer, he took the initiative to make the refrigerator run and cool the beer. However, this angered Kasugi greatly 
because Akre used electricity as he pleased, just to chill the beer. On the other hand, when Kasuji's subordinates saw Akra cooling the beer, they were delighted because Akra had a brilliant idea by utilizing the available electricity. Kasuji, who didn't want to reveal his true nature to his subordinates, immediately put on a facade of being a good person since Akra used to be his colleague in the same office. He had no choice but to maintain this facade as long as his subordinates didn't leave the area. Frustrated by Kasugi's incessant nagging that tortured his psyche, Akura could only resign himself and listen to Kasugi's anger as his actions disrupted the remaining electricity supply. On the other hand, Kento was infuriated by Akura's change in attitude just because he had encountered his former boss. Shizuka had to explain to Kencho that she couldn't forget her deep-seated fear, especially when, in the past, she had experienced something similar herself.